Atlantic City, located on Absecon Island, up against the Atlantic Ocean, is perhaps the most iconic city in New Jersey. It is known as a gambling hub and as a party town, full of big casinos, flashy lights, and loud music. It was once wildly successful, but now has among the highest unemployment rates in the United States, and a perpetually struggling economy. This video looks back at the history of Atlantic City and examines how it became the place it is today. Absecon Island was largely undeveloped until the 1850s, when local doctor Jonathan Pitney realized that the area had the potential to become a health retreat. He figured that the people of Philadelphia and New York would love a health retreat to Absecon with its cool sea breeze, if only they had a way to get there. Pitney began pushing for the establishment of a railroad, and he ultimately got one created running from Camden to Obsecon. With rail transportation connecting the island to the cities, hotels and businesses started setting up quickly. The area became an incorporated municipality in 1854, under the name Atlantic City. Atlantic City's popularity as a vacation destination grew even more in the 1870s due to a key innovation, the invention of the boardwalk. The Atlantic City Boardwalk was the first of its kind in the world, but it wasn't originally intended to act as the fun, walkable downtown that it became. Instead, it was initially a set of slightly elevated wooden boards put up along just one mile of beach for the lackluster reason of preventing too much sand from getting trekked into hotels and trains. Regardless of the original simplistic intent, it soon became clear that many people enjoyed walking around on and hanging out on the boardwalk, so it was expanded along much more of the city. The Atlantic City boardwalk transformed from a sand containment device into a destination in its own right, and once other towns saw how successful it was, boardwalks began to be built in beach towns all around the United States. While we're on the subject, here's a fun fact about boardwalks. You've probably assumed your whole life that boardwalks get their name from being composed of wooden boards, right? Don't worry, I used to make the same mistake myself. But in doing research for this video, I found out that boardwalks are actually named for the guy who came up with the idea of the Atlantic City boardwalk, Alexander Boardman. Hmm, the more you know. Another major innovation came out of Atlantic City in the following decade. Saltwater Taffy. According to legend, saltwater taffy was invented when a large nighttime storm caused foam from the ocean to spray over the wares of a taffy seller with a stall on the boardwalk. The candy man was upset that his taffy was ruined until a girl came up to him and asked for some taffy anyway. The seller gave it to her, calling it saltwater taffy, and was surprised when she liked it. Thus, the Jersey Shore's most famous sugary treat was born. The first company to market saltwater taffy widely and make it a popular, well-known candy was Freilinger's, a store on the Atlantic City boardwalk, though Freilinger's soon received some strong competition from another company hoping to enter the market, James Candy. Eventually, both competitors would come to be owned by the same people, and all was right with the taffy-selling world. The 1870s gave Atlantic City its boardwalk, and the 1880s gave the city its taffy. You may think that that would leave the 1890s with little left to contribute, but you would be mistaken. In 1898, Steel Pier opened. This amusement pier, stretching from the boardwalk out over the ocean, quickly became one of the most fun parts of town. Billing itself as the showplace of the nation, Steel Pier had food, music, events, and eventually games and rides. Just about anything you can think of. With such a perfect storm of things to offer, and an easily accessible location near some of America's largest cities, Atlantic City became one of the top vacation destinations in the whole United States. The Roaring 1920s were the height of Atlantic City's popularity. 
the original Atlantic City Convention Hall, which has since been renamed Boardwalk Hall, opened on the boardwalk. Music legends like John Philip Sousa and Frank Sinatra regularly performed in the city. The Miss America beauty pageant was set up in town, and the Steel Pier added one of its most iconic attractions, the Diving Horses. Yep, starting in 1929, the Steel Pier would ascend horses and riders up on a platform high above a pool and have them dive into it. Another factor that contributed to Atlantic City's popularity in the 1920s was... Da -da -da, prohibition of alcohol. The ratification of the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banned alcohol in the United States. And that, um, technically included Atlantic City, but only technically. See, the Mafia had close relationships with Atlantic County's leaders, most famously... Enoch Johnson, often referred to by the nickname Nucky Johnson, who was the boss of the political machine that effectively ran the Atlantic County and Atlantic City governments. Nucky and his allies essentially agreed not to enforce the bans on alcohol, prostitution, and gambling, allowing all three to become easily accessible in the city, much of it run by the Mafia. This is one of the few examples of organized crime actually increasing tourism in a region. Atlantic City became known as the world's playground, and people from all across the United States would come to Atlantic City to engage in the vices that they would be punished for at home. You couldn't necessarily drink or gamble out in the open, but it wasn't hard to find venues and back rooms that the authorities would leave alone. The 1920s era of Atlantic City's history has been popularized and, to some extent, fictionalized by HBO's hit TV show, Boardwalk Empire, which follows the story of a character based on Nucky Johnson. In 1929, the Mafia presence in Atlantic City was so strong that the city was chosen to host an underworld convention where a bunch of organized crime families came together to discuss planning for organized crime's long-term future in the U.S., and how organized crime families could make more money by fighting each other less and cooperating more. So, yeah, Atlantic City basically hosted a big mafia planning summit. It has come to be called the Atlantic City Conference, if you feel like looking it up. After the 1920s, however, Atlantic City experienced the first of two major economic downturns in its history. There were several reasons for this. The first was the Great Depression, which of course hurt area businesses and decreased the amount of people willing to spend on tourism. Another factor was the end of Prohibition, which occurred via the 21st Amendment in 1933. Now that alcohol was legal, there was less of an incentive to travel to get it. This factor took away some of Atlantic City's lawless mystique. In the early 1940s, Nucky Johnson himself was convicted for tax evasion in federal court and got shipped off to federal prison in Pennsylvania. Even after the Great Depression and World War II, Atlantic City continued to struggle while the rest of the country rebounded. Several technological innovations contributed to this economic woe such as growing ownership of automobiles, the creation of the interstate highway system in the 1950s, the advent of commercial aircraft, and the fact that air conditioning became more common. All of these things decreased the appeal for tourists to come to Atlantic City. They could now afford to go to other places off of the rail lines using their newly bought cars. Getting to farther away beach destinations like Florida and the Carolinas wasn't nearly as long of a trip by plane, and the need for ocean breeze simply isn't as strong when your house has a machine cooling it off. Thus, the competitive edge that Atlantic City had in the 1920s was gone. One important event that occurred during this economically depressed era of city history was the 1964 Democratic National Convention which was held in the historical Atlantic City Convention Hall in August 1964. Remember that that's the building now called Boardwalk Hall. The 1964 presidential election 
would be the first presidential election since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson had assumed the presidency as a result of that assassination. In the 1964 convention, the Democratic Party nominated incumbent President Lyndon Johnson as its candidate for president, and nominated Senator Hubert Humphrey for vice president. Robert Kennedy, JFK's brother, gave an emotional speech on the convention's final night. In the November following the convention, Lyndon Johnson went on to win the 1964 presidential election, defeating Republican nominee Barry Goldwater in a massive landslide, which included Johnson winning every county in New Jersey. However, perhaps the most important aspect of the convention was its role in civil rights history, due to controversy surrounding the delegation from the Democratic Party of Mississippi. At the time, the Mississippi delegation was racially segregated, having only white members because black voters had been barred from participating in the delegate selection process. So, a group of civil rights activists from Mississippi formed the racially integrated Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or MFDP, and selected their own delegates to the convention. The MFDP demanded that its own delegation to the convention be seated, claiming the old, segregated delegation was illegitimate. In pursuit of this goal, MFDP delegate Fannie Lou Hamer gave a famous speech to the convention's credentials committee talking about the difficulties African Americans faced trying to register to vote. President Johnson, who was trying to walk an awkward political line between not alienating black voters and not alienating racist white voters, tried to work out a compromise between the two Mississippi delegations, in which two delegates from the MFDP would be seated at the convention along with the regular Mississippi delegation. This would be coupled with a promise of integrated delegations at future Democratic conventions. However, the MFDP rejected the deal, viewing the two seats as token representation rather than true acceptance of their goal. The proposed compromise also angered many members of the original Mississippi delegation and the Alabama delegation, causing many from both to walk out of the convention. Unfortunately, hosting the Democratic National Convention didn't help Atlantic City recover from its downturn. In fact, it arguably hurt the city even more by shining a spotlight on how far it had fallen from its glory days. The outlook of Atlantic City remained superbly bleak until the 1970s, when New Jersey policymakers realized that legalizing and taxing gambling might be an easy way to raise revenue and to bring economic development. Plenty of businessmen were eager to get in on the venture. In 1970, lawmakers put forth, and New Jersey voters approved, a referendum to create a state lottery system. After that was in place, lawmakers turned their sights to legalizing casino gambling. At the time, the only other state which allowed casino gambling was Nevada, home to the world-renowned gambling mecca of Las Vegas. Casinos in New Jersey, it was reasoned, would have an easy market among people from the East Coast who wanted to gamble, but didn't want the expense or hassle of a trip across the country. Thus, in 1974, the New Jersey legislature authorized a referendum to legalize casinos statewide, though this referendum narrowly failed. Two years later, lawmakers reformulated the casino legalization referendum, restricting casinos solely to Atlantic City. This version of the referendum was passed by New Jersey voters overwhelmingly. The first legal casino in Atlantic City, Resorts Atlantic City, opened in 1978, and many others soon followed. At the height of its gambling days, Atlantic City was home to 15 casinos. The casinos began to revive Atlantic City's reputation as a mystical, impossible land where people could indulge their vices, and maybe even strike it rich in the process. Business mogul and future U.S. President Donald Trump owned several casinos in Atlantic City, most famously the Trump Taj Mahal, 
though he doesn't own them anymore, since they eventually fell into the same financial woes that plagued the rest of the city. See, legalizing casinos in Atlantic City to spur economic growth was a strategy that worked, at first. But pretty soon, other states caught on and started to legalize gambling themselves. This wave of legalization included all three of New Jersey's neighbors, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York. For the second time in its history, Atlantic City had lost its competitive edge and experienced yet another major decline. People were no longer as incentivized to go to Atlantic City to gamble, because now they could do so right in their home states instead. The late 1990s and 2000s saw many of Atlantic City's casinos board up, and thousands of people lost their jobs as a result. By contrast, Las Vegas was able to survive the legalization of casinos around the country, in large part because it had more family-friendly attractions to bring people in beyond just casinos, and because its economy as a whole was more diversified. Atlantic City's recipe of being tied almost exclusively to one industry was a recipe for economic disaster. So, what lies in store for Atlantic City going forward? Some hope to revive Atlantic City once again by bolstering the casinos and gambling that made the first revival possible. In mid-2018, the closed Trump Taj Mahal and Revel casinos reopened as the Hard Rock Casino and Ocean Resorts Casino, respectively. Some hope these new casino openings will draw new tourists into the city and expand the gambling market, creating many jobs in the process. However, others fear that the new casinos will only steal visitors and revenue from existing casinos, causing some casinos to cease to be viable and close up, costing the jobs of those who work at them. As evidence that this fear may be valid, Ownership of the Ocean Resorts Casino has already changed hands, suggesting it is already experiencing financial difficulties. As an avenue for benefiting the state's casinos, during the 2010s, the state government pursued litigation to overturn a long-standing federal law that prohibited states which did not already allow betting on sports matches from legalizing it. This effort finally paid off in spring 2018, when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the law, allowing states to legalize sports gambling. New Jersey was ready and waiting for this result, and had sports betting up and running at casinos and horse racing tracks by mid-year. It is hoped that adding another form of legal gambling will draw people back from nearby states into Atlantic City's casinos, Yet this effort may itself be hindered when other states catch on and legalize sports betting themselves, once again stealing Atlantic City's competitive edge. Other attempts to help Atlantic City have focused on diversifying its economy beyond gambling so that the city remains viable even if the casino industry takes a hit. There has been work towards this goal already. For example, just recently, Stockton University opened a new campus in Atlantic City, and a giant new Ferris wheel began operating on Steel Pier that may contribute to the city's year-round and family-friendly tourist offerings. Personally, I think economic diversification is the most important thing the city can do to secure a stable future in the long run. That's it for the history part of this video so I'd like to conclude by talking about what there is to do in Atlantic City if you decide to visit yourself as a tourist. The most obvious tourist attractions of Atlantic City are its casinos. They of course offer gambling, but they have so much more as well, from world-class restaurants and nightclubs to nightly shows by famous bands and comedians. In addition to the casinos, Boardwalk Hall also regularly holds concerts and events. While you're in Atlantic City, make sure to walk the boardwalk. You'll see plenty of shops, arcades, and restaurants, and you can even buy your own box of the city's famous saltwater taffy. 
you'll get to see New Jersey's Korean War Memorial, located adjacent to the boardwalk. As you walk the boardwalk, you may recognize several street names from the classic Parker Brothers game, Monopoly. That's because the spaces on the original American Monopoly board are based on Atlantic City streets and neighborhoods, with many of the relevant streets running across the city and ending at the boardwalk. Of course, the most expensive real estate on the Monopoly board is the boardwalk itself, as per the success and glamour of Atlantic City's boardwalk. To this day, Steel Pier offers an array of games and rides, including the aforementioned Ferris Wheel, which offers great views of the Atlantic City skyline and Atlantic Ocean. You can also pay for an admittedly quite expensive helicopter ride taking off from the pier. Thankfully, one attraction you can no longer see on Steel Pier is the diving horses. That ridiculous and cruel to animals act stopped back in the 1970s. If you're a lighthouse fan, Atlantic City also has one of those for you to climb on certain days, the Absecon Lighthouse. If you're visiting Atlantic City during the summer, you can also enjoy free light shows projected on the side of Boardwalk Hall several nights each week. And of course, you can enjoy the beach. Atlantic City's beach is one of New Jersey's few remaining free beaches, meaning you don't have to pay for a beach tag to use it. If gambling, entertainment, beaches, boardwalks, games, rides, light shows, and restaurants aren't your thing, Atlantic City has several museums you can visit. One of these, located on the boardwalk, is the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, which shows off all manner of things crazy and weird. Another is the Noyes Art Garage, an art museum, where visitors can both view galleries and watch artists at their work. That's all I have for today. It isn't meant to be an exhaustive list of all the things to do in Atlantic City. Just a few highlights. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the history of Atlantic City, and that perhaps you'll even visit the city yourself soon. If so, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell to get more videos about all things New Jersey. Have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.